to walk in his statutes. Okay, yeah. I like that. Right? So, I mean, that's the evidence. Exactly. And if you get rid of the statutes, how can you say you're walking in the spirit? Exactly. Good point. Well, you may be walking in a spirit. <laughs> that's Not right. A spirit. Okay. It's it's already whenever Christian wants to begin. <laughs> All right. Well, I was waiting for my wife to take out the babies, but that's okay. I uh, let me put on the screen. That way I have it up. I think David needs to do the Sabbath. That's what? right. <laughs> let's let's take advantage of that. <laughs> well, we didn't do the ninety-five. Oh, that's right. And the fourth just commandment. Just a minute. Hang on just a minute. And that's a statute. That's a commandment. <laughs> okay. All right. Once again, everyone, uh, welcome and happy Sabbath. And we'll begin with Reading Psalms 95, verse 1 through 7. The Bible says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is great God and a great king above all gods. His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. <clears throat> and once again, the fourth commandment, we're told, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven, earth, and the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Amen. Go ahead, Christian. Okay, Christian. All right. So, pulling up the screen here, just shared the screen. So, let us have a word of prayer before we begin. Merciful, loving Father, the only true God, our, our Heavenly Father who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. You are the most holy and you dwell in the most holy. And Father, we want to thank you that we can come boldly before your throne of grace and mercy because of the blood of your son. We want to thank you that through his blood, there has been made peace with us and that you are teaching us, guiding us. Uh, you have justified us through his blood so that we may be instructed and taught of you, that you may uh, lead us and guide us, direct us. And Father, you are worthy of our praise and thanksgiving now and always. Father, as we uh, look at this message regarding the Omega of Deadly Heresies, Father, you had given this message and trusted it through your spirit, the spirit of prophecy, through Ellen White. And Father, you had foretold many things that were going to happen and that should befall uh, the Adventist people, the great struggle that we would go through. You carved out with the great cleaver of truth, uh, this people and Father. Why should it be that you should, uh, you should suffer so great a loss as people are turning aside to heresy, turning aside to Baal worship, turning aside to that which cannot profit, Father, I'm asking that you will hear us as, as a living God, as the true God, as the one who's created us and redeemed us. Uh, 
And Father, that your Holy Spirit might speak with us now, and that your Spirit might speak through me as I go through this particular message, that it may shine light, light from your throne room, and that we might receive edification, uh, instruction in your spirit, uh, in your word, and Father, that we may be instructed in your truth. I thank you so much, Father, for all you do. Please take this time, and may you be glorified, and your Son at your right hand. And we pray it all in the name of your beloved Son, Yeshua. Amen. All right, so we did do the last, uh, some weeks ago, we did the Omega of Deadly Heresies. We looked at part one and showed the development of the Alpha of Deadly Heresies, which was regarding the Kellogg conflict in uh, the Adventist church. And we saw that it was not permitted to prevail within the church uh, to, to any great extent. It, it thankfully was mitigated by the, the work of the spirit of prophecy meeting that crisis. And of course, because they were not willing, the, the church at that time was not willing to pull down the pillars of our faith, which had stood for so long a time and had been established by the pioneers. However, when the pioneers began to die off, things began to change. We saw that the alpha of deadly heresies and the omega of deadly heresies were definitely doctrinally uh, in lockstep with each other. They, uh, both of them, uh, are referring to the Trinitarian doctrine of God, the very doctrine of Baal, and which is what we what we saw as we sort of went through the course of those presentations. We saw that it has made its inroads through the work of the Jesuits, particularly through uh, Leroy Froome, and uh, there was un many underhanded workings to bring this uh, this heresy. Uh, of the Roman Catholic Church into uh, into the the Adventist denominational church. Now, what we're going to see, though, is we're, as we're progressing, we're going to kind of see where all of this is going. So we looked at it in the past with the Alpha. We looked at it as it developed and it integrated itself within to within the denomination, and now we're going to go from that point and we're going to bring it to our present day and what the implications are uh, because the implications are not something uh, insignificant because this is not just any heresy. This is the Omega of deadly heresies. All right. This is uh, if you are to consider a doctrine of devils, this is the masterpiece of the devil to to cast and bind us in, in, cast us in his snare so that uh, he can blind our eyes to Christ, who is our righteousness, to, to effectually stifle our spirituality and to prevent us from not only seeing the truth, but being guided into all truth because we don't see that Christ, who is the truth, is enjoined that the, it is the spirit of Christ who is the spirit of truth because he is the way, the truth, and the life. So we want to look at that. Now, we saw that Baal is the God of Babylon, that Trinity is Baal worship, that the Trinity was pushed in the heavenly courts. The Trinity was pushed at the Tower of Babel. The Trinity was spread throughout all the heathen nations at the scattering of the, the, the men who were working together in the confederacy of the Tower of Babel. The, the Trinity's set apart day is Sunday, the day of sun worship. Uh, the Trinity was not believed by Ellen White or the Adventist pioneers. The Trinity was the central issue, the crux of Kellogg's apostasy by his own confession and increasing uh, manuscript evidence by Kellogg himself says that the issue was the Trinity. But thankfully, it had failed at that time to counter reform Adventist non Trinitarian position. Ellen White had given warnings. She said, I'm charged to tell our people that some do not realize that the devil has device after device and he carries them out in ways that they do not expect. Satan's agencies will invent ways to make sinners out of saints. 
I tell you now that when I am laid to rest, when she dies, great changes will take place. I do not know when I shall be taken, and I desire to warn all against the devices of the devil. I want the people to know that I warned them fully before my death. She had given a warning that great changes would take place and that she had given a full warning as to the nature of what the devil would do, making inroads into the church to turn sin, to make uh, to make sinners out of saints. She says the omega that there was the alpha and she said the omega would follow afterwards and would be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning God has given. Now that she said she had warned fully and this was the warning that the omega should come and nothing would be permitted to stand in its way. She said, be not deceived. Many will depart from the faith. She doesn't say some. She says many will depart from the faith. In the great controversy, it actually says a large class who professed faith in the third angel's message. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We have now before us the alpha of this danger. The omega will be of a most startling nature. Benjamin Wilkinson, we, we looked at this last time as well. He said, replying to your letter of uh, October 13th regarding the doctrine of the Trinity, I will say that the Seventh-day Adventists do not and never have accepted the dark, mysterious Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. That was in 1936. And so it was at a, he was present and he was certain that they did not accept it. Now, B.G. Wilkinson vigorously opposed Leroy Froome, and Leroy Froome vigorously opposed Benjamin Wilkinson. And unfortunately, B.G. Wilkinson, um, he didn't have the upper hand, and Leroy Froome largely prevailed against Wilkinson. But we still have writings from B.G. Wilkinson to this day, uh, Truth Triumphant being probably the, the greatest gem that Leroy Froome tried to destroy among his works. Ellen White said that a counter-reformation would happen, and we've seen that through the work of Leroy Froome. The enemy of souls, she said, has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, and that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result? The principles of truth that God had, in his wisdom had given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders of this system would go into the cities and do a wonderful work. It looks great. The Sabbath, of course, would be lightly regarded as also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. The leaders would teach that virtue is better than vice, but God being removed, they would place their dependence on human power, which without God is worthless. Their foundation would be built on the sand. And what is the result? Storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. Everybody saying the church is going through, the church is going through here in Europe. Everybody says, glue your, your posterior to the pews. The church is going through. And yet the church has gone through a massive process of ecumenical reorganization. The church is not what it was. When you look at the denominational church today, it looks nothing like how the church used to look. If you go back to the old Sabbath school quarterlies, they are diametrically opposed. Those old quarterlies teach you how to learn and to hear the voice of God and to be taught from God. 
Whereas, and they ask a lot of questions and they get you to go back into the Bible and they make commentary minimal because they don't want you to lean on man's thoughts. On the other hand, you have quarterlies today that have a few Bible verses and it's largely commentary every single day so that it can change the trajectory of what you are thinking, whether you realize it or not, very subtly. The whole foundation of the, the, of the general conference being a church itself, which it never was a church formally, has changed the whole organization into something that it wasn't. And Ellen White says storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. The foundation that was laid for the Omega, we saw the Ministerial Institute uh, was formed by the time that the last pioneer had died. And that the ministerial association was to pastor the leaders of the church and the scholastic institutions, providing direction and material to direct the church into receiving the Trinity. To teach the future pastors of the church that this is the direction of the church. To give them the materials that were going to be the basis for the professors of, uh, of the, the schools such as Andrews University or Loma Linda. Leroy Froome led the work of counter-reformation. Then we saw an unofficial church manual, which contained fundamental beliefs in 1931. It was not voted in. It was made by four men. That was it, four men. Unofficial, at the, at just years after, there was an unofficial but mandatory baptismal covenant and vow to the Trinity in 1941 to 1944 on all new members of the church. The only ones that didn't have to accept it, of course, were those who had already been locked in by their baptism into church membership before the Trinity was an issue. They did not have to make a vow to the Trinity, but that they would just sort of die off as time went by. 1940s, the book of evangelism was compiled. Leroy Froome and his associates compiled it, and he goes to the men of Babylon for direction, for inspiration. 1944, there was a revisal of the pioneer writings and the hymnal, and there was attempts to revise Ellen White's writings, which, by the way, they're strongly undertaking that work now. Um, then there was, in the 1950s, secret evangelical conferences, and Ellen White's writings were rejected by the general conference leadership. That sounds pretty serious, and that was only to the 1950s. But there were, of course, other things going further than that, which were more devastating in the 1980s. They made it official, all those things that they were doing unofficially. By the time 50 years comes by, I mean, they're, they're used to it. They, they, they say, okay, yeah, we've had a church manual for a long time. We've had fundamental beliefs for a long time. We're used to the baptismal covenant of vow. So it just becomes standard, and they just sort of vote it in. And it's a Trojan horse into the church because the people were immersed in that kind of culture for many, many years. Now, when we look at Nimrod, Nimrod was the king of Babylon. Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, it says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he, uh, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel or Babylon. Okay, so he was the king of Babylon, Nimrod was. And Nimrod's name is very interesting if you understand and you can read Hebrew. Because Nimrod literally means several things. It depends on how you, you look at the name. But the roots and all of the words, it can mean several things. So I'm going to show you exactly what it means. If you can't read Hebrew, it's okay. I put the, the English meaning on the side. At first, the whole name, Nimrod, means we shall rebel. That's what Nimrod means. So the whole system of Babylon, of course, a kingdom, is characteristic of the king that is over that kingdom. So when, it's, when Nimrod's name is we shall rebel, that's very, very serious. The whole Marad, the second part of his Nimrod, right? Marad, okay, that Marad means to rebel. And if you look at Rod, it means to be unruly or to be without rest. 
it's interesting that Babylon, the people of Babylon, the, those who take the uh, worship the beast in his image and receive the mark, it says that they have no rest day or night. They're unruly. They're without rest, rod. And then if you look at it from uh, just uh, rad, from uh, rebel, it means to subdue or beat down. So nimrad, okay, would mean we shall, basically we shall, from subduing, we shall beat down. So the whole idea is oppression. It is rebellion. It has no rest. And it is speaking of a collective people. Nimrod's name was so symbolic of Babylon, what Babylon would stand for. In fact, the first ecumenical movement that we see in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 11. We don't see or hear much about the ecumenical movement in, except in prophecy. We know the Catholic Church was involved in the ecumenical movement. We see a lot of things going on with the ecumenical movement today. But right in the very first book of the Bible, we see an ecumenical movement. What was the basis of it? Well, Nimrod was king over Babylon. Genesis 11, verses 1 through 4, it says, The whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they came and found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. By the way, Shinar is the same land where the king of Babylon built the great golden image to be worshipped. That's also a form of rebellion, right? They, the whole people were rebelling, Nimrod. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. First ecumenical movement. Genesis 11, verse 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. Interesting, the people are of one accord. But it's not the Spirit of God that they see when they're in one accord. Like you see on the day of Pentecost. It's the working of another spirit. They're one in purposes that are contrary to the purposes of God. They're one in rebellion. So behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now the worship that was found in Babylon was based on Trinitarian worship. It was based on the worship of the sun, the serpent, and fire. When Nimrod had died, it was said that he became the sun god and that Tammuz, his son, was symbolic of the serpent. And then you have the fire representing Semiramis, his wife. Then when you get all the way down to the kingdom of Babylon, which the Israelites were taken captive to, there were three gods that were all surrounding the walls of Babylon, you probably heard of the Ishtar Gate. There were three gods represented. One was Marduk. It's interesting if you actually look at Nimrod, you have Marduk, okay? So it's actually the same word. Most people don't realize that Marduk from, from the gates of Babylon, which is represented by a dragon. That's it, Marduk's animal, his sacred animal, is a dragon. And his name means rebellion. Marduk, Hadad, and Ishtar. Okay, all synonymous with sort of the same figures that are just changing slightly in name over time. You can see the depiction on the walls of Babylon, what that looked like. You see the lion on the bottom. That was representing the lion of Ishtar. Then for Hadad, you had the Orok. And then you have the dragon at the top, which is actually looking like a serpent with, with feet and legs. And that was sim, uh, symbolized for Hadad. This was the, uh, that was, sorry, that was Marduk. And those are the three that represent the, the gods of Babylon. It was the Trinity that was found. Daniel found himself immersed in the very culture that was very forbidding. 
because it was dedicated to the Trinity. In fact, even more probably revolting is Marduk. Another name for Marduk was Bel. All right. And he was, they actually called him Belteshazzar. They actually named him after, they named him after the most rebellious dragon god. Can you imagine how that, he, that how he must have felt about that? What a trying situation. So the chief god of Babylon, Marduk. And this is what it says in the Encyclopedia Britannica. <clears throat> Marduk in Mesopotamian religion, the chief god of the city of Babylon and the national god of Babylonia as such, he was eventually called simply Bel or Lord. <clears throat> have, have any of you ever said, dear Lord, in your prayers? I'm not saying that we should, we should say the name carelessly. We should fear God, right? And we should... <clears throat> I'm not saying that we should use the name on our, on our lips very lightly. We shouldn't. Uh, Marduk was later known as Baal, a name derived from the Semitic word Baal, or Lord. Baal had all the attributes of Marduk, and his status and cult <coughs> were much the same. That's under the entry Marduk in the Encyclopedia Britannica. <clears throat> pretty pretty startling, isn't it? Why did the people in Israel go into Babylonian captivity? Well, the reason was because of a conflict of the Trinity. A conflict where they were taking the chief God. They were already baking cakes to the Queen of Heaven, which was Ishtar. But they went further than that, and they were worshipping. They were burning incense to Baal, which was Marduk. Chief God of Babylon. <coughs> Jeremiah 7 verses 8 through 10 says, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom you know not? Mystery gods, because they don't know them. And come stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, we are saved. To do all these abominations. In fact, it's an abomination of desolation. When the women are weeping for Tammuz, as Ezekiel sees, it says, so it's interesting, you've got all of them there. You've got Baal, which is symbolic of Marduk. You have the Queen of Heaven, which is symbolic of Ishtar. And then you have Tammuz in uh, Ezekiel, living at the same time as Jeremiah. Sees, so you see the whole trinity is involved in the, the, the worship, the abomination, which ended up letting the people go into captivity, where they were brought into Babylon. Storm and tempest swept away the structure. Where was the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord? Elijah's controversy was against the worship of Nimrod, which was Baal, Marduk. He was against rebellion. And against the rebellion of the people. And so when we speak up against the Trinity and we don't be silent, when we meet what's going on, even if they should put us away, we are directly opposing Babylonian worship, the very chief, the very capstone of Babylonian worship. And it is, it is Nimrod. It is rebellion. As a result, the ark was taken from the chosen people. Second Maccabees <laughs> quotes from the Chronicles of the Babylonians. Where you've probably heard of the Chronicles of the Medes and Persians, quoted at the end of the book of Esther. There's also a Chronicle of the Babylonians. And so Second Maccabees quotes from this and says, And Jeremiah, having received an oracle from the Lord, commanded that the tabernacle and the ark should follow with him. And he went out <clears throat> unto the mount whither Moses had gone up, and he beheld the inheritance of God. Uh, uh, and he had beheld the inheritance of God. And Jeremiah came and found a cave dwelling, and he brought there the tabernacle and the ark and the altar of incense. Then he sealed up the entrance. Some of those who followed him came up intending to mark the way, but could not find it. When Jeremiah learned of it, he rebuked them and said, the place shall remain unknown till God gathers his people together again and reveals his mercy. 
means that, you know, the Ark of the Covenant will be found again. And it's very interesting that we already see sort of the, a preparation for that with Ron Wyatt. Uh, very interesting and very promising that the Ark of the Covenant will come to light in the last days and very soon. Uh, I'd like to add Jeremiah 28 verse 11. We're, we're told by Hananiah was a false prophet, but he said that what was going on, the nature of Nebuchadnezzar's captivity. It says, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nation within the space of two years. Okay, so obviously that was a false prophecy. But it does tell us that the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, was over all the nations of the earth. And we see Revelation 17, we see prophetic Babylon, and she has made drunk with the wine of her fornication all the nations of the earth. It's very ecumenical, by the way. If you look at the ziggurat of Babylon, <coughs> they, they were dedicated to all the gods of the nations. So that was the first ecumenical movement, and we see that it was very much in harmony uh, with Babylon. The spirit of Babylon is ecumenical and trinitarian from the beginning all the way to its end. So we shouldn't be surprised if we see that the very same thing, the very same spirit is found within the Catholic Church. Catholic Catechism, it says Christians are baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Before receiving the sacrament, they respond to a three-part question when asked to confess the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I do. The faith of all Christians rests on the Trinity. Now remember, this is a covenant to the Trinitarian God that they're required to make. Okay, and that's exactly what was happening in the church. You had to be consecrated to Nimrod, to Baal, to the dragon. The mystery of the most holy trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. It is therefore the source of all other mysteries of faith, the light that enlightens them. It is the most fundamental and essential teaching of the hierarchy of the truth of faith. Okay, so where is this going? Well, obviously, it's a, quite a, an astounding, you know, uh, statement, especially in the light of Adventist history and compromise. Well, it continues. <clears throat> it says the sacred mystery of the church's unity. The church is one because of her source. The highest exemplar and source of this mystery is the unity in the trinity of persons of one God, the Father and the Son and in the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit dwelling in those who believe and pervading and ruling over the entire church who brings about that wonderful communion of the faithful and joins them together. So notice what it says. It says it's because of the Trinity that unity is possible. It's because of the Trinity that communion together is possible. And it's because of the Trinity that you can have the same spirits and it joins, it binds people together. Okay. So that's the basis of unity. Well, ec the ecumenical movement has Christian unity at its core, at its, as its basis. That's what its goal is, is to join and to bind the people together in communion. But look at what they say after. But in subsequent centuries, much more serious dissensions appeared by the Reformation. And large communities became separated from full communion with the Catholic Church. Especially true when you reject the Trinity. The ruptures that wound the unity of Christ's body. Here we must distinguish heresy, apostasy, and schism do not occur without human sin. So it says, listen, the Catholic Church has received a wound in the unity which they once had. And the reason that they received this wound that needs to be healed is because of heresy. Well, whose heresy? Well, it could be Martin Luther's heresy. It could be John Wycliffe's heresy. It can be John Calvin's heresy. It can be all the reformers' heresies. It can certainly be the Seventh-day Adventist heresy. Anything that would wound needs to be reversed and it needs to be healed. 
So what is heresy to them is maybe truth to us, but what is truth to them is heresy to us. In fact, the omega of deadly heresies to us. Now, the first ecumenical council of the church was the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea, the first ecumenical debate held by the early Christian church, concludes with the establishment of the doctrine of the Holy Trinity. Convened by Roman Emperor Constantine the first in May, the council also deemed the Arian belief of Christ as inferior to God as heretical, thus re resolving an early church crisis. Okay, so it, it makes it sound like there's a problem and they addressed that problem and they brought orthodoxy and unity through the Nicene Creed. It was an ecumenical council that established the doctrine of the Trinity. And they say that therefore Trinity is based on unity. Well, it's pretty startling when you realize that that's how the Trinity has come into the churches through ecumenism. Now, <clears throat> McGill University published an article, the first council of Nicaea. It says the first council of Nicaea held in Nicaea in Britannia uh, in present day Turkey. Um, convoked by the Roman Emperor Constantine I in 325, was the first ecumenical conference of bishops of the Christian church, and most significantly, the, in, the, in the first uniform Christian doctrine. It resulted in this, most significantly. So that was where the uniformity, the unity came. With the creation of the Nicene Creed, a precedent was established for subsequent general councils ecumenical councils of bishops to create statements of belief and canons of doctrinal orthodoxy, kind of like what you see with the general conferences going on today, that every general conference makes amendments to the church manual or they, and they, they do things so that they can walk in step together, right? The intent being to define unity of beliefs for the whole of Christendom, a momentous event in the history of the church and subsequent history of Europe. So unity and Trinity and ecumenism are all joined together in Catholic orthodoxy. Interestingly enough, in Encyc Encyclopedia Britannica, under the entry of Easter, the Council of Nicaea in 325 decreed that Easter should be observed on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox, Easter, therefore, can fall on any Sunday between March 22nd and April the 25th. So you have, during this first ecumenical council, something that was established. You have ecumenism, okay, in the basis of uh, their unity. You have the Trinity as being the very cornerstone of that. And you have pagan feast days. Those three things are bound up together. And it's no coincidence that the day of the Trinity is Sunday. That is because it's really the Trinity is the sun God. It's Baal worship. We'll read some of those things in the Douay Catechism of 1649. It says, it is a day dedicated, Sunday, is a day de dedicated by the apostles to the honor of the most holy Trinity. It is also called Sunday from the old Roman denomination of Dies Solis, the day of the sun to which it is sacred. And the year of grace by Pius Parch, every Sunday is devoted to the honor of the most holy Trinity, that every Sunday is sanctified and consecrated to the triune God. Sunday after Sunday, we should recall in a spirit of gratitude. Remember, this is not Ellen White. It's actually the spirit that's opposite of that. The gifts which the blessed Trinity is bestowing upon us. Sunday, therefore, is the day of the most holy Trinity. So can you see how pagan feast days, ecumenism and Trinity go together? I think it's very clear. Now with Leroy Froome, Leroy Froome had said in his book, The Movement of Destiny, the results of what was taking place because of the inroads of the Trinity. He said, we are no longer subject to a legitimate charge that on the eternal fundamentals, we were divided or in conflict with the testimony of the soundest Christian faith of the centuries. The culminating events of the decade 1931 to 1941, consequently marked an end to the old epoch and the beginning of a new day in unification, an auspicious witness for us as a movement. It was definitely another major turning point 
in denominational history. Remember, Leroy Froom had a meeting with the evangelicals. And what resulted, and this is what he was saying, <clears throat> was that when he had when he had met with those evangelicals, that there was paved a way where they were no longer regarded as a cult. They were seen as being definitively Trinitarian, that they were in agreement with the eternal fundamentals, the orthodoxy of the Nicene Creed. And so therefore, the Adventists could not possibly be seen as anything but evangelical brethren to these other churches. And that they believed in, they were not divided in, they were believing in the soundest Christian faith of the centuries by believing in the Trinity. And it was all beginning of a new day of unification. The old ways of the church had passed away and all things had become new, but not for better, but far for worse. It was a turning point indeed. When you look at the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, some of the changes that took place, you've probably heard in excelsis Deo, uh, you know, the Gloria, right? Um, this song, it actually says, look, at, let, let, let me read this. See him in a manger laid, whom the choirs of angels praise. Mary, Joseph, lend your aid while our hearts in love we raise. Have you ever sung that song before and not realized or taken conscious thought? We're supposed to sing songs according to the Bible, sing with understanding. Sing praise with understanding. How many times has that song been sung in the church? And you sing that and you don't even realize that you just sang to Joseph and to Mary. You realize that's, that's a very Catholic song. So, and of course, in 1909 and 1941, the Adventist versions of uh, Holy, 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 the pioneers had changed it and it was changed back in 1941. Uh, in 1909, it was God, God over all who rules in eternity, and it was changed instead to be God in three persons, blessed Trinity. So that was what it read. The pioneers changed it. And then after the pioneers died, the Jesuits came in and they changed it back. Counter-Reformation. We see that the chief textbook for the Trinity uh, in the denomination written by three men, John Reeve, Jerry Moon, and Woodrow Whedon. You can see the triquatra there, the symbol of sorcery. Uh, and that is the chief textbook in Andrews University. And this is what they say. So some people will say, well, listen, the Adventists don't believe in the Catholic Trinity. We don't believe in the Nicene Trinity. We don't believe in the same Trinity that they believe in. But let's look at what is actually written. In, in the book itself. I think it's that's fair, right? In 1930, and I got this right out of the book. In 1930, that's why you can see a scan. Maybe the, 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 the words are a little bit small. In 1930, responding to a request from the African Division for a statement of what Adventists believe that would help government officials and others for a better understanding of our work. The General Conference Committee appointed a subcommittee. There was four men. I'll just jump down. To prepare a statement of Adventist beliefs, Wilcox, as the leading writer among them, drafted a 22-point statement subsequently published in the SDA yearbook of 1931. The second point spoke of the Godhead or Trinity, and the third affirmed that Jesus Christ is very God, an echo of the Nicene Creed. Don't let anybody tell you it's not the same God, not the same Trinity. It's not, it's just not true. Lest anyone think that the Seventh-day Adventists intended to make a creed, the drafters of the statement sought no formal or official approval for it. And that actually was to its advantage because by not doing that for 50 years, that gave it resounding approval. 15 years later, when the statement had gained general acceptance, the general conference session of 1946 made it official. That's sort of not so voting that no revision of the statement of fundamental beliefs as it now appears in the manual shall be made at any time except at a general conference session so okay crystallizing it that's one thing 
they they made it firm so you can't move you can't shake this idea of the trinity that's coming in this marked the official the first official endorsement of a trinitarian view by the church although one well-known anti-trinitarian continued to uphold the old view until his death in 1968. So who was wrong? Well, according to the very book itself, it says more, more recently, a further question has arisen with increasing urgency. Was the pioneer's belief about the Godhead right or wrong? As one line of reasoning goes, either the pioneers were wrong and the present church is right, or the pioneers are right and the present Seventh-day Adventist church has apostatized from biblical truth, if the pioneers were correct. This is the logical implications, right? Remember what she said with the Omega, that the history of the last 50 years would be accounted as error. That was while she was still living. That was all the history of the pioneers. Definitely the presence of the Adventist church has apostatized because of the Omega deadly heresies from biblical truth. Seventh-day Adventists, a brief introduction to their beliefs. This is written by... Um, uh, this is by Woodrow Whedon. He said, with respect to the doctrine of, this, of God, Seventh-day Adventists are in harmony with the great creedal statements of Christendom, including the Apostles' Creed, Nicaea 325, and the additional definition of faith concerning the Holy Spirit as reached in Constantinople. However, such was not always the case. You realize that's written by somebody who wrote a textbook for the pastors in the university for Adventists. This is saying absolutely, hey, we're in harmony with the creedal statements of Christ Christendom. We have accepted the Nicene Creed. Well, Easter is not an issue when you already just do that kind of stuff anyway. Right? You keep Christmas. I mean, you already have heathen holidays. Sabbath not such a big thing when you don't really have God's holy days in place anyway. And so you see that he's making it his boast that it's not just this, this uh, creed, but it's that creed as well. Amazing. Now, a letter from Leroy Froome to General Conference President Figure in April 1955 regarding the evangelical conferences that took place in 1955 and 1956. He says, I do not know where this will all lead, but we do know that we have one friends in a powerful circle, friends that we believe, that believe that we have been unjustly treated and are set to make a defense of our adherence to sound biblical positions. <clears throat> of course, you know, as I said already, that they were now seen uh, by some very prominent evangelical leaders. Leroy Froome gave over that we don't we reject the non-Trinitarian statements by the pioneers and Ellen White. And therefore we are we are Orthodox, we are Trinitarians. And so giving that impression, they said they had one friends. They were now united and they had one friends in a powerful circle. Wow, very interesting. When you look at that, we're in harmony with the great creedal statements of Christendom. We have one friends in a powerful circle, evangelicals, all having to do with the Trinity. What were the results? 1957, questions on doctrine says, we are one with our fellow Christian denominational groups and the great fundamentals of the faith once delivered to the saints. Whoa, man. Do you understand what that says? The faith once delivered to the saints. <clears throat> it's calling the saints the Catholic Church. And this is, was an official church document. This was the results. <clears throat> what happened in 1957 after this? The Seventh-day Adventists joined the Christian World Communions. 1965, Burt Beverly Beach becomes the Seventh-day Adventist ecumenical liaison with other denominations. 1970, Burt Beach is elected as the general secretary of the annual conference of secretaries of the Christian World Communions. This represents about 2 billion Christians and covers more churches than any other organization. And he held this position until 2003. It's interesting that <clears throat> when that happened, it was almost like it dominoes. 
where now all of a sudden the church is starting to take on a much more ecumenical stance and it's going violating the very spirit of the second angel's message babylon has fallen Written at the same time, or a little bit after, in 1973, it was called So Much in Common. It was written by <coughs> Burt Beach in cooperation with the World Council of Churches. So Much in Common between the World Council of Churches and the Seventh-day Adventist Church was published by the World Council of Churches in Geneva, Switzerland. And it said, <coughs> the member churches of the World Council of Churches and Seventh-day Adventists are in agreement on the fundamental articles of the Christian faith as set forth in the three ancient symbols or creeds, Apostolicum, Nesiano, Const Constantinopolitan, and Athanasium. Ooh, those are mouthfuls. This agreement finds expression in unqualified acceptance of the doctrines of the Trinity and the two natures. So much in common with all of the ecumenical environment. Winning friends in a powerful circle. Bert Beach wrote in so much uh, in this book, so much in common by the in cooperation with the World Council of Churches. Strange as it may seem, these yearly consultations are an indirect, meaning these uh, yearly consultations with the World Council of Churches are an indirect uh, byproduct of Vatican II. That was a huge ecumenical council of the Catholic Church, just so you know. Um, in, and Bert Beverly Beach had been there uh, and basically sold off the church. In fact, well, in Rome, in connection with the Vatican Council, a World Council of Churches staff member and an Adventist representative came to the conclusion that an informal meeting of a small group of Seventh-day Adventists with an equal number of representatives from the World Council of Churches would fulfill a useful purpose. Indeed, it does. Adventists would, in, being insufficiently informed regarding the World Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches staff and church leaders being equally in need of additional and more comprehensive knowledge regarding the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, we can have a mutual understanding. Let's come together. Let's, let's study. Right? Let's get to know how much agreement we have. Let's build bridges. So, in the article, Adventists in the Trinity by Roy Allen, Allen Anderson, this was in 18, 1983, says, what do you folks believe about the Trinity was a question put to me some years ago by two gracious Christian gentlemen who came unannounced to the General Conference headquarters. This is for the evangelical conferences, he's recounting this. They discovered that we are, were in harmony with the sound biblical scholarship, not only on the Trinity but on every other cardinal doctrine of Christianity. So isn't that interesting how you begin to see this harmony, unity, coming together, this, this sense that now we can be brothers, we can be friends, we can be in fellowship, we can even start pursuing communion together because of the Trinity. 1977, Pope Paul VI rewards Bert Beach with his book, for his book um, with a private audience in the Vatican. Beach presents the Pope with a book and a golden medallion confirming friendship of the Adventist church with the Vatican. And then he writes concerning this, it was in the Adventist review, the medallion is an engraved witness of the validity of the 10 commandments. Well, the other commandments are simply represented as Roman numerals. Understand symbolism here. This is a symbolic gesture. He's giving a coin with Ten Commandments with Roman numerals. The words of the fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, are written out on that coin. Well, you know what's startling about that? It doesn't say, uh, right, that the seventh day is the Sabbath. It doesn't say anything about that. It just says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy with Roman numerals. And he gives it into the hands, representing the Adventist church, he gives it into the hands of the Pope in 1977. Quite a symbolic gesture to say, now the church is in your hands. What happened after? Well, the ex-Jesuit priest Alberto Rivera was interviewed in uh, 1983 by an Adventist documentarian and producer, James Arabito, who, by the way, was also killed by the Jesuits. Um, I mean, I can't confirm that, but I'm, I'm fairly certain about that. 
because uh, my understanding is that Pat Arabito, they tried to pay her. They offered her a million dollars just uh, to uh, to wash out these documentaries that he had produced, exposing the Jesuits and having an interview with Alberto Rivera, who also was killed by the Jesuits. Uh, he had an assassination attempt about, about five, five times, and then the sixth time it succeeded. Um, <clears throat> He had confessed that the Jesuits had succeeded in taking over the Adventist church and stated that all the mainstream churches were taken over by 1980. What happened in 1980? Well, we're told in the, the official Adventist website under ecumenical movement, it's the official Adventist website, just go to ecumenical movement. In 1980, the General Conference set up a Council of Interchurch Relations in order to give overall guidance and supervision to the church's relation with other religious bodies. This council, from time to time, uh, from time to time, authorized conversations with other religious organizations where it felt this could prove helpful. The church became ecumenical. 1980. What else happened? The 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 in 19. Well, I'll just read what happened by the scholar. Uh, from Friedensau Adventist University, Stephen Hoschel. He's a professor of systematic theology. And so he's, it's not, he's, just, he's not a novice. He doesn't know nothing. This is what he says about the Council of Interchurch Relations in 1980. He said the major achievement of 1980 session of the Denominational General Conference was the formulation of a thoroughly revised set of fundamental beliefs. Remember, the Trinity came in through that officially. At the same time, it made a lasting impact on Adventist interchurch relations by establishing a sub-organization devoted completely to this activity, the Council of Interchurch Relations, with Bert Beverly Beach as its first secretary. This organization would make, a ma would make the major contributions to the development of the Adventist interchurch relations profile by organizing dialogues, cultivating relationships with leading representatives of other churches, and supporting the management of annual meetings of the Secretary of Christian World Communions. You realize the magnitude of what happened in 1980? Not just accepting the Trinity, bringing the inroads and making it official, but that they had become, the Adventist Church had become a thoroughly ecumenical organization. Have you ever wondered why the churches are actually reprimanded for sharing the great controversy, because they are. There is serious problems and there's conflicts internally with the leadership when it's suggested to do so. And not just this, there's other issues that are going on. When you speak about the beast, when you speak about the mark of the beast, when you speak about the image of the beast and you begin to make that point a little too prominent, you begin to get into trouble in the church. He begins to say some interesting things. This is the, by the way, this is still Stefan Hoschel. I just kind of, I put the wrong title here. I rec he sa and he says, these were the decisions that were made in 1980. To recommend the general conference attendance or representation at non-Adventist church or religious meetings, commissions, assemblies, or consultations in various parts of the world. Power to act. So now they, now the inner, inner uh, church uh, uh, the Council of Interchurch Relations is able to do that. They are also, also authorized to send invitations by the General Conference to non-Adventist church leaders to attend some day Adventist meetings, sessions, or commissions as observers, consultants to give counsel, resource persons or guests, power to act, authorize conversations or dialogues with other churches and religious organizations that where it could prove fruitful, power to act. They're giving a lot of authority to them. Authorize cooperative ventures, such as studies, consultations with other churches or religious organizations where found desirable and feasible. Where it is found, number five, where it is found that this would be helpful, authorize SDA presence or observer membership of certain non-denominational commissions or committees. You understand how startling that is and this has been part of the church the whole time that's a new organization that was established the churches were completely taken over by 1980 
Neil Wilson, what does he say in 1981? Neil Wilson, now the general conference president before he wasn't. Uh, he announces that the church had officially adopted the Trinity doctrine and that it was now number two in the church's 27 fundamental beliefs. And then he declares in that same time in a different article, there is another universal and truly Catholic organization, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Neil Wilson pushed the Omega of Deadly Heresies through into the church. And when that happened, and when it was voted through, then we see that the church is now Catholic, ecumenical, Trinitarian, in rebellion, Nimrod. 1982, not so long after, baptism, Eucharist, and ministry from the World Council of Churches. There was an agreement signed by the General Conference Church. This is an official signature. They say they're not involved in these things, but it's not so. They agreed to these three points. Let me read those. The first they agreed to is baptism, to encourage all churches to make no issue of the mode of or the age of baptism. It means baby baptism is okay. If adult consent and decision baptism is practiced by immersion, that is acceptable, as equally is infant sprinkling. Don't make an issue of it. It was signed by the church in 1982. The Eucharist or the communion, right? To encourage all to accept equally the various concepts, whether they be transubstantiation, consubstantiation, or the fact that the bread and wine are symbols of the broken body and spilled blood of Jesus Christ. Accept it. It's okay that they believe that they're actually crucifying and eating Jesus' literal blood and breaking his literal body and that the priests have power to put him into a little wafer. It's okay. It's okay. Don't make an issue of it. Let's accept it equally. That was signed by the Adventists. Third, ministry. To encourage all churches to work for the unchurched, but never to proselytize from other churches. Have mercy. That's, that is the absolute crucifixion of the second angel's message. And if you get rid of the second angel's message, you get rid of the third angel's message, and you can certainly not be abiding by the first angel's message. We're coming closer to our time now, 1907 World Evangelical Alliance. There was a joint declaration by the Adventists and the World Evangelical Alliance. This is a joint statement by them both. And so the point I, I want to read, and this is an extract from the document, a scan, says theological com com conversations took place on August 6th through 9th, 9th, uh, 2007 at Andrews University. Took place on Adventist grounds to make a joint statement, a joint declaration with a huge ecumenical body, a leading ecumenical body in the church in, in among the, the Babylonian churches. And this, this conversation was between the theologians representing the world general uh, the general conference of some of the Adventists and the World Evangelical Alliances. This was a follow-up meeting to the theological conversations that took place at the European Baptist Theological Seminary in Prague in 2006. So there was a lot of things going on quietly. These conversations took place in an atmosphere of amic amicable Christian fellowship and study. Remember, this is Babylon here. Are we to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness? No, we're to expose them. And built, and so they had a, a they were building on the history of increasing fellowship, trust, and cooperation in various countries. Then they put something in the statement: our common faith. A common faith with Babylon? Point two, the participants were pleased to be able to ascertain an extensive commonality of belief and spirituality. Adventists can subscribe to the World Evangelical Alliance Statement of Faith, which they signed. They fully accept the authority and supremacy of the word of God, the Trinity, the divine and human natures of Christ, salvation by faith in Christ alone, the importance of prayer, personal conversion, sanctification, and Hold dear the blessed hope of the imminent second coming of Christ and the final judgment. There was agreement that there should never be any say, date, date setting regarding the second advent. So a lot of that sounds really good. Until you realize, like, hey, they just signed the document. If you want to know the names of what were 
uh, who were on each side, you can just see on this list here, who were part of the, uh, the World, World Evangelical Alliance delegation and the Seventh-day Adventist delegation. Bert Beach was there, um, Angel Manuel Rodriguez, Dennis Fortin, Roy Gain, maybe some of those names you actually know. William G. Johnson. We're almost finished here. There was an article here. Why Adventists participate in the UN and ecumenical meetings is the Adventist Review official website. Why do Adventists participate? And it was kind of like a cover, you know, October 9th, 2015. It was written by Ganun Diop. It's the, the you can see the black man over there on, standing on the left, right beside Ted Wilson. <clears throat> and he said, Seventh-day Adventist believers shower me with questions when they learn that I have represented the Adventist church at the United Nations and the meeting uh, and at meetings of Christian ecumenical organizations. Now, understand, Ganun Diop, not only did Burt Beach sell off the Adventist church, but when Burt Beach died, died, somebody had to fill his shoes, big shoes to fill. Ganun Diop just happened to be just such a man that could do that very thing because he was also Jesuit educated. And so in writing it, he said, in principle, this is in what he's writing, in principle, Adventists choose not to be involved in doctrinal alliances with other churches because of the Adventist adherence to a holistic and integrated approach to biblical doctrine <clears throat> and because of the upholding of doctrines that the Adventists consider to have been sidelined, changed, or forgotten in the course of church history. So far, it sounds okay. That said, unity is not a bad word. Adventists value unity just as God does. Unity is grounded in the existence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. You see where this is going? Adventists promote unity for the sake of mission. Well, wasn't it mission? That was the very thing that they said that they could work together never to proselytize each other. Absolutely it was. They signed a document the World Council of Churches on. Adventists promote unity for the sake of mission to make Christ known to all peoples, groups, languages, tribes, and nations. Christians can also unite to make the world a better place through the promotion of health, education, humanitarian work, and the promotion and protection of human rights. He says, listen, we can work together with other Christians. Unite with them. And he says it in the context of the Trinity. With this example in mind, the global church unity could only be a reality if all Christians adopted the Catholic worldview or understanding of reality. <laughs> and if all the Catholics gave up their deeply held beliefs. Nevertheless, there is much that unites Christians beginning with the foundation of unity itself. Unity is dear to the heart of God. The whole plan of salvation demonstrates God's determination to unite his divided and dispersed family, which he created in his image. Unity is grounded in the being of God, who is the Trinity, a unity in trinity pretty startling what he's saying under adventist and interchurch relations he says the following adventists recognize other christians as genuine members of the body of christ but adventists do not hold formal structural membership in ecumenical organizations primarily for freedom of religion purposes membership in an ecumenical body would limit the freedom to share one's convictions with everyone else and thereby jeopardize a universal end time mission as Adventists understand it. Very startling that he doesn't say it's because of the three angels messages. He doesn't say that. He says it's because of religious freedom, because we want to be able to do what we want, how we want to do it. And, you know, uh, we just don't want to be stifled by ecumenical organization. Adventists do not, are not part of the ecumenical organizations that require membership, but they do enjoy guest or adaptive observer statuses and meetings in accordance with the above council the general conference the administrative body of the adventist world church has inscribed in the general conference working policy that church leaders recognize every agency that lifts up christ before men as part of the divine plan for the evangelization of the world that would include for them the catholic church the jesuits and hold in high esteem the christian men and women in other communions who are engaged in winning souls to Christ. I don't want to keep reading, but he talks about how they are wanting to have sort of a unity with the World Council of Churches. You can come back to this video and you can uh, on Bible Explorations uh, page and you can you can look at it from there. 
but it says at the bottom, Seventh-day Adventists support Christian unity as they join the triune God who is determined to gather people created in his image. So he constantly is sort of pounding this point, right? Unity, Trinity, unity, Trinity, unity, other denominations, Trinity. We can be in unity with other denominations, Trinity, right? And so, and he says seven, and then he lists at the bottom of the article, 27 ways Adventists can encourage Christian unity. And so I don't want to read all of this. I'm just going to read point three. Adventists in united in shared identity, a new humanity recreated in the image of God, <clears throat> uh, the image of Jesus Christ, the glory of God, the Father, through the Holy Spirit, theological unity about fully embracing God's identity revealed in scripture as Trinity. All right. So you can kind of see how that's all connected, right? Christian World Communions re very recently said something. Uh, there was a meeting, rather, in Rome, in the Vatican. The annual conference of secretaries of Christian World Communions took place in Rome in October, from between October 11th to the 13th in 2016 on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Judgment, on the Day of Atonement that they went there. And it was a Seventh-day Adventist general secretary, Gunun Diop, that led them and they prayed with the Pope on the Day of Atonement. That's judgment. This <clears throat> unformal ecumenical forum that goes back to 1957 sees itself as communions of churches belonging to the same tradition and held together by this common heritage, conscious of living in the same universal fellowship. You know that universal, by the way, in Latin is uh, Catholicos. <laughs> living in the same Catholicos, universal fellowship, and giving to this consciousness at least some structured, visible expression. I, I'm not going to read all of this, but it was saying in the Christian World Communion's website. You can see here, uh, if you can look uh, about the middle of it, it says the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists just before the line which is struck through. Says the, the General Conference of Seventh day Adventists, they were part of this group. And you can actually see Gunu and Diop. Pope, Pope is right in the middle, all the different leaders of the different denominations, and then the G General Secretary of the Christian World Communions, who is a in one of the highest positions uh, in the General Conference. Gunu and Diop is standing to the far right. Gunu and Diop. On Adventist News, it says Ganun Diop, uh, Director of the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty for the Seventh-day Adventist World Church, recently returned from two major international gatherings, a meeting of the Conference of Secretaries of Christian World Communions held in Rome, Italy. <laughs> but he was, you see how he was greeting the Pope there. Um, very interesting. They They went together to pray all together, and they prayed with... They prayed with him. <laughs> they prayed with the, the Pope as though they were all a great big family. Well, this is where we're just about ending now. Ganun Diop said this at Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace and World Affairs. He, he said this. It was an interview with him. And he was talking about his, uh, his education at Jesuit University in France and how he was kind of raised up by a Catholic uh, bishop and, and all of these different things in this article. It was very long, and very shocking. But he says this, we belong to the family of Christians who confess the Trinitarian God. Can you see how the church has become incredibly ecumenical? So the Pope responds to this. And what does the Pope end up saying? He, I'm just going to go down to the second. It, it actually says the, the, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists in here. You can see it on that one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, the fifth line down says General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. So it's definitely there. This is the official Vatican website, by the way. And the Pope was addressing the Christian World Communion's delegation and Ganun Diop, the Seventh-day Adventist, so-called, that brought them there. And he calls his address to them, the ecumenism of prayer, the journeying in blood <clears throat> on the day of judgment. <clears throat> it says in his brief address, the Pope referred to two phrases used by the head of the delegation. That is Ganun Diop. What did the head of the delegation say? He said, Jesus is with us. 
and Jesus is journeying with us. That's pretty startling because he just said to the leading men of the, the evangelicals and to the mother of harlots, to the very king of Babylon, representative, the pope. He said that Jesus is with us and Jesus is journeying with us. And so he said, these phrases made me reflect. And they posed two questions. Am I capable of believing, this is what the Pope said, that Jesus is with us? Am I capable of journeying with all together and also with Jesus? Often we think that ecumenical work is only that of theologians. So he just keeps kind of going and going. And he says already, he talks about an ecumenism that's real an ecumenism of prayer, and he talks about unity and the need for unity through ecumenism and to work towards this end against uh, injustice in the world and hunger and all of these different kinds of crimes. And he says, all together, we must help. Love for our neighbor. This is ecumenism. This is already unity, unity in journeying with Jesus. The church has changed, friends. It's not what it once was. It's a new organization built on the sand. And storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. And it is Baal worship of the highest order. Do you stand for it? Do you believe in it? Has the Ark of the Covenant been taken away? Has it been hidden away from the people just like when the just like when Jerusalem, when the chosen people had gone into Trinitarian worship? of the queen of heaven, of Baal, of Tammuz. Was the same thing happening? Absolutely. That the, the Ark of the Covenant was taken away from them. The Ichabod, the glory has departed. We're told by Ellen White, the religion of Jesus is in danger. It is being mingled with worldliness. Worldly policy is taking the place of true piety and wisdom that comes from above. And God will remove his prospering hand from the conference. Shall the Ark of the Covenant be removed from this people? Shall idols be smuggled in? Shall false principles and false precepts be brought into the sanctuary? Shall Antichrist be respected? Shall the true doctrines and principles given us by God, which have made us what we are, be ignored? Shall God's instrumentality, the publishing house, become a mere political, worldly institution? This is directly where the enemy through blinded, unconsecrated men is leading us. If she were alive today, those words have been startlingly fulfilled. Yes, the Ark of the Covenant has been removed. Yes, idols have been smuggled in. Yes, false principles and false precepts have been brought in. Yes, Antichrist has been respected. Yes, the true doctrines have made us what we are have been ignored and accounted as error. You know that the GC session just passed, the 61, 61st General Conference session. Uh, Ted Wilson was voted back in as a General Conference president. So this was just, this was just like two weeks ago or something. So it's very fresh. Um, and it's sad to see where the church is now. Uh, and, and some of the devices that went in, there was people that tried to stand in and to speak up against Ganun Diop, and they were not permitted to do it. And they forced him in by a very sham kind of vote. And so Ganun Diop is in again, and Ganun Diop arranged a, uh, an ecumenical luncheon with, during the uh, 61st General Conference session in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. And it was with the General Secretary of the Christian Global Christian Forum. And you can see him standing, the General Secretary, standing right beside Ted Wilson with his book, Let Mutual Love Continue. I'm going to read just a few statements, and this is where we end. Five centuries of conflict, rivalry, and prejudice between Catholics and Protestants are being overcome, slowly but surely, through a profound conversion, a journey in the opposite direction. That means they're going back. It means backsliding. A backsliding church lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Ellen White said that. That allows the churches together to distance themselves from the mistakes oh, and exaggerations what? that led to their separation and to discern and take up the gifts that God is giving to each. You realize he's holding that very book right beside Ted Wilson right after this general conference session? Gathered from 24 different church families, we welcome one another. 
please stand as we acknowledge your church family. And he goes through this great big list of, of different individuals, old Catholic, Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Salvation Army, Seventh-day Adventist, United and Uniting, Waldensian. Friends, this is, this is unhinged when you look at this. And there are four different, 24 different church families. Well, that's interesting because in heaven, it, Babylon is actually trying to mimic and to mock Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem has 24 elders that officiate as priests in the heavenly sanctuary. Interestingly enough, there were 24 courses of priests. So in Babylon, they're using 24 courses of priests. 24 fallen church groups that constitute Babylon. Just so you know. Let mutual love continue, said the Reverend Ganun Diop. Right in the book, it says about Ganun Diop, is listed as a global Christian forum committee member who represents the Seventh-day Adventist Church USA. Ted Wilson addressing the Global Christian Forum after his re-election as conference president said, what a privilege for Seventh-day Adventists and other Christians to be epistles of Christ, representatives of the highest authority of the universe. And I just want you to see this. This was um, by Pope Francis. May the Holy Trinity make Christians grow in unity. And he says, may the Holy Trinity communion of love make us grow in unity. Uh, it is urgent that we set aside preferences to promote the common good. And so our good example is fundamental. It is essential that Christians pursue the path towards visible, full visible unity. That, that's where I end. I, I, I hope that you are as startled as I am as to what has happened in the church. And that you can see the spirit of the church. It's not the same spirit. It is thoroughly the spirit of Babylon. And so we see that there has been a conversion, an internal process of reorganization. And if we only could know, it's kind of like that proverbial, you know, the, the lobster that's cooking in the water, the frog that's cooking in the water, you know, and it doesn't realize until it starts boiling to death. We don't realize just how bad it got until we go back and we really look step by step at all the little pieces that have happened along the way, we realize this is not the same church. So let's pray. And um, I, I pray that you will be sober, that you will understand the significance of this and that you will touch not the unclean thing. You'll come out from among them that our heavenly father may receive us as his children. Truly. It's a very serious thing right now. We don't want to be compromising with Baal worship. We don't want to be halting between two opinions. Let's pray. Merciful, loving Father in heaven. Father, you have given us great light. You have given us great warnings. And I thank you, Father, for the spirit of prophecy. I'm so thankful, Father, that you told us beforehand that we may take heed. You've given us warnings. And you said great changes would take place after Ellen White had been laid to rest. And we see that. We thank you that, that you haven't left us without a light. We thank you, Father, that the light that is behind us, whether it goes back from the apostles and their observance of the statutes and the faith once delivered to the saints and also to the pioneers and the pillars which they established. As we look at the light behind us shining from 1844, we thank you that it will shine all the way into your holy city. <laughs> Please, Father, make us ready to be in unity with you through the spirit of your son and not father uniting with Babylon, not partaking of this world spirit, not being among the large class that will deal treacherously against you, that will sell off truth for worldly compromise. Help us heavenly father to not be part of a false priesthood, but to be truly part of that heavenly priesthood and father to be part of the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Even if it means that we have no names written on church books on this earth, we thank you, Father, for your great goodness and love. We commit our souls into your hands and ask that our, the five, as we are separated, we feel so alone at times. 
that we will thank you because you have reserved and that 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal, to Nimrod, to rebellion. Cause us to stand faithful and true and keep the fire, the holy fire, the most holy fire from your presence, from your spirit, burning fervently in our hearts. We thank you so much, Father, for this. In Yeshua's name, amen. Yeah, Chris, thank you very talking, much. I started talking about Diop about five or six years ago. I wrote a letter and his secretary, two of them answered. And I wanted to, uh, I was asking about an article. Did the uh, Seventh-day Adventist class hands with the Roman church? They said that he would write back, which he never did. And I presented uh -huh. that at uh, Bible Exploration three or four times. Now, yeah. I watched this last Vatican, I mean, this general conference session. <laughs> You're right. There's two people that stood up and said uh, to the nominating committee, please go and reconsider. One of them mentioned his name, the other just his position. And yeah. both of them, they did not go and reconsider. And they just re-nominated him. And in and fact, they, all, they, they made them vote on the list entirely. Yes. You had to, and when you voted on somebody, there was a list of 20 names and their ministry departments and said, you can, you can speak if, whether you want the list or not, but you have to speak on the list generally. You're not allowed to speak on the, the one that we're nominating in this 20 different uh, uh, ministerial <laughs> leaders. You can't speak their names and you can't speak what department they're part of. So you can't yeah. say it really anything at all. And they muzzled them completely. Well, the one that did mention his name, they was reprimanded shortly after that. They also were supposed to be a church of protesting. They also flew the Vatican flag there. It's not the same church. It's not. And there's, there's, there's not, you know, we're so endeared to this church. You know, because it's like, it's kind of like the mother that we're being weaned from, you know, and I can understand that. I can understand that that's where, like, we've gotten our bearings and that's where some of us were raised. And I, I get that there's like, there's really like, we get sort of the warm fuzzies, you know, at the same time, well, it's not what it was. It's not your grandmother's church remember that the, played piano there. The you know? church is, the church won't go to heaven. Right. The denomination not going to have wings. <laughs> and this is where and this is where Christ says what we will be brought up in front of, you know, judges for a testimony against them. Yeah. All these things that occur are being written up above. Amen. Amen. We just yeah. got to pray for the people that are in there because a lot of them right now, if they were to go up there, they'd be like, well, I guess it's okay. You know, the church seems to think it's okay and they know. And it's like, that's not going to, that's not going to save them. Well, I wonder when we're going to really own. take like a hard stand against this and say like, listen, this is Baal worship. And like, are we going to say nothing about it? Is it just going to be kind of like, well, if you want to, I want to be nice too. Like I, I'm kind of a friendly person, kind of like a yeah. teddy bear a little bit. And sometimes that's, that gets in the way and I want to be nice to everybody, but honestly, there's some things that we've got to, we've got to be a little bit more, we have to have a bit more of a backbone on, you know? And that's where we, we go out and get the quote Adventist, you know, the world will come in later. They'll see us, but there's yeah, yeah. so many in the church right now that really mm -hmm. need to see it. And you sure. try and tell them and all you can do is plant that seed and God will, yeah. Move them one way or the other, but we can only do so much. Well, see, when yeah. he first, when this article, inside this article says that when he met with Pope Francis, that they signed an, uh, a document saying that the Seventh-day Adventists would no longer um, protest or say anything at all bad about the Catholic Church anymore. I would love to see that document. Okay, well, Christian, you said you'll be with us next week. Are you going to oh, do more grace. on this, or did you have some other? Um... Mm, I'm I, I'm going to pray about it, but I, I might okay. I might finish it this this off entirely, and then uh, that way I don't have to. You know, it's kind of like a series that people can follow okay. along. On. Yeah. All right. Well, we will all be here. So, and those of you that are on here, we will see you. Um, 
Oh, Chris said thank you on his question and answer. Can I just ask a question while, while we're on? Uh, Violet, are you, is everything okay? Oh, I can't hear her because she's muted here. You're, You're muted. muted. You're muted. Uh, You're muted. We can't yeah, hear muted, you. Maybe. Violet. She may not have there, no. there we go. Now you're unmuted. No. Yes, I'm fine. For an old woman, I'm doing pretty good. Okay. I don't know if you were on here, Christian, but Carol's not feeling well. I asked how she was, and she said that she's not really sure what it is, but she's tired and is not feeling really well. So yes. hopefully she'll well, be okay. Yeah. We well, we have Marvin. To Keep everybody in prayer. Yeah. Amen. Um, yeah, I was, I was just anyway. asking because I just thought look Violet looked a little bit. I wasn't sure if she looked a little bit sad, and I was like, okay, I wanted to be sure everything was okay. Well, she keeps hearing about all the church; it makes her sad. It's, it's sad for sure. Yes, the things I keep hearing is it's heartbreaking, yeah. but we have to. Take each day as it comes and praise the Lord for that 